Hey, good morning, friends. This brother Mike. I'm back on the uh, Sunday morning podcast for my shut-ins and my friends. Uh, we like to get together on Sunday mornings. It's just a friendship thing. Want to share some stuff with you today? Got another good one for you. Uh, before that, I want you to remember, please. Um, we have two live services every week, Thursday and Friday nights at 7 o'clock. Both of them broadcast on our YouTube teaching channel, plus other platforms. Um, we have three Zoom services every week. The ladies' Zoom is Monday nights at 6.30. Wednesday and Saturday night is Zooms for everybody, 6 p.m. You wouldn't believe how annoying these services are. It's quite remarkable. Men and women invited to the uh, Mental Illness Training Seminar. It's every Tuesday night at 6.30 in the small sanctuary. And they'll be going over the book I wrote, The Root, Cause, and Cure of Mental Illness. It's a book for Christians, how to get Christians cured of mental illness. Not sinners, it's for born-again Christians who are mentally ill. So this is what, um, this is what God is wanting to train you to do because, as you know, in our society, Satan is, is, is taking, taking command. He, he's in charge now, and um, he's destroying the country. It's all over, and um, <clears throat> it looks like uh, Kamala Harris is going to win the next election, and trust me, friend, that will be the slide right into the re the rise of the Antichrist. America will be destroyed. We will be bankrupt. There will be no way to stop it. Wokeism will sweep the country. And uh, the destruction is going to be absolutely incredible. So every Christian, every born-again Christian needs to prepare for the trauma ahead. And, in my opinion, for the uh, rapture and tribulation, which is from my view, only a few years away now. This thing's going to speed up rapidly and decline sharply. 
Uh, it's really getting scary. I feel deep sickness and sadness and compassion for the church. They are unprepared for the destruction that's coming. Church people are very unprepared, very unversed in the word of God, very weak. Uh, most Christians are spineless and gutless, and they are ripe for the pickings. And the devil's going to put it on us. And this thing, this isn't going to go well at all. If you're in the Phoenix area, uh, we have a counseling center in our ministry. Please give me a call, 602-636-5800, 602-636-5800. I'll put you on the counseling schedule. If you are a born-again Christian, there's no charge. Um, please remember I have uh, uh, um, once a month we have a deliverance training class on the fourth Saturday of the month at noon. And if you're interested in the deliverance ministry, please please get me uh, please get my uh, 18 classes, the training training course that I offer. It's 18 classes on healing and deliverance. Let's go to John chapter three. It's an extremely famous chapter, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, right near the top. And you recall what happened. Jesus is having a conversation with Nicodemus. And it's not going well. Nicodemus uh, has an exceptionally high IQ. And when it comes to spiritual things, healing and deliverance and other things, extremely intelligent people are at a real deficit. As I've said many times over the years, if you're extremely intelligent or if you're stupid, those two groups, dummies and geniuses, they do very poorly with the gospel. Dummies can't grasp the basics of it, and people that are extremely intelligent overprocess spiritual things and they think too much about them, which renders them useless or a waste. It's better to be kind of in the middle. Generally speaking, of course, there's an exception. Generally speaking, it's better to be in the middle, middle, you know, on the Stanford Binet intelligence test or the Wexler uh, adult intelligence scale. You know, 100 is the statistical center point or average, if you will, or median of human intelligence. Supposedly, half the population in the country is above at or above 100 IQ, and the rest of the country is at or below uh, 100 IQ. It's better to be around the 100 IQ area, a little bit below, a little above. That's when the gospel tends to work its best. Remember, remember it's the simplicity of Christ that brings in miracles. Childlike faith, not intelligence, education, or IQ brings in miracles from God. It's childlike faith. And that's difficult for people that are extremely intelligent. So Nicodemus, as you see here, he is really struggling with spiritual things. And Jesus sums it up in verse 13. He says, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 12. He says, if I have told you of earthly things, how will you believe me? And you don't believe. How will you believe me if I tell you about heavenly things? Now, in this verse, uh, earthly things is the Greek word epigeus, and it means terrestrial things. Paul mentioned that to the Corinthians. There's a celestial and a terrestrial world. The terrestrial world, the earthly world, is the natural world you can see and experience with your five senses. The celestial world is the heavenlies, and uh, that's what Jesus is talking about here, heavenly things. Eperonius is the atmosphere around the earth where angels and demons transverse and spiritual warfare occurs. He's not talking about Uranus heaven where God is, throne room, 
the river of life, the tree of life, all that's in heaven. Jesus is not talking about that. He's talking about the heavenlies around the earth, the spirit world that you and I live in and is amongst us. Okay, for example, in your house right now, when you're listening to me, there's an angel in your house, a guardian angel standing there. You can't see him. There are demons in your room watching you. You can't see them. That's the heavenlies, Eperonius, the uh, heavenly realm, so to speak. Heaven is a separate place. And Jesus is not talking about that. That conversation ends with Nicodemus in verse 12. Now John picks up the narrative of his incredible gospel. Uh, the greatest of all four of the gospels is the gospel of John. No man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man who is in heaven. Now here you see Jesus was already in heaven, and John wrote the gospel of John after the ascension. Because he says here, the Son of Man who is already in heaven, Greek word en, en, which means to go into something. Verse 14, as Moses was lift, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, check this out. Verse 17. Now it gets really interesting. For God did not send his son into the world. That's not the planet Earth. That's cosmos. Cosmos is the human world, humanity. God did not send his son into the human world, into humanity to condemn the world, to condemn humanity, Greek word krino. <clears throat> now, I've gone over this before, and I apologize if you've already heard it, but in the, in the Bible translations, most of them actually, almost all of them, they make the same mistake. They use one English word to describe other multiple Greek words. Well, the problem is, that causes the text to be a little skewed. So if you don't know what condemn means, <clears throat> and you don't know what the English word judge means, you're going to get these verses all screwed up. In this particular verse, the word judge and condemn is the same. And the three Greek words for judge are krisis, krino, and katakrino. Those three words have different meanings, but they're all translated as judge or condemn in the King James Bible and the New King James and some of the others. Cresus means to judge something by evaluating it. That's the Greek word used when the Bible says that we are to judge each other. Prophets are to judge one another. Croesus to evaluate without coming to a conclusion of the judgment. You just evaluate the situation without condemning the person. Crino is translated as judge or condemn, and it's translated as condemn in this verse we're talking about. Crino means to do Croesus, evaluate, and then come to a conclusion or render a verdict. You evaluate the situation and you come to this conclusion. You looked at all the evidence and you concluded that this person was an adulterer. Crino. Crino. Jesus said God did not send his son into the humanity to judge, evaluate them, and come to a conclusion. He sent, he sent the son into humanity to judge them, Christus, but not to condemn them, Crino. When you sin, God is not judging you. 
evaluating your sin. He finds it wrong. And now you are condemned. You're guilty. You're going to die. You're sentenced to death. You're sentenced to have calamities hit you. You're sentenced to have an earthquake hit or tornado, a meteor. That's not, that's not what he's doing. The Son of God did not come here to evaluate you and condemn you, judge you, come to a conclusion. You're a sinner. It says he came here so that humanity, cosmos, could be sozo saved or delivered. That's why he came here. God didn't send his son to evaluate you and condemn you. Hey, you sinned. You are a sinner condemned to death. Crino. He sent him there to Croesus, judge you, and save you, deliver you. Then it says, Jesus says, this is how it, it all works. Here's how it can happen. He that believeth on him is not condemned, crino, evaluated and judged, guilty. He that believeth on him is not condemned. The Greek word for believeth there is a present continuous tense verb, pistuo, meaning that the a person that believes on him takes action and and actively believes and follows Christ. He that believes. It's not the Greek word phroneo, where you believe in your head, or logosmos, where you evaluated Christ and came to a conclusion he's a good guy. That's a that's head knowledge. Head knowledge, like Nicodemus, head knowledge doesn't work. It must be a spiritual experience. As Jesus said in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Ganeo anathon means to be generated or born from above. It's a spiritual experience the person can actually sense and feel. It's something that really happens to you. Born again. And he that believeth activates his faith, does something, participates in Greek verb. A verb is an action word. Okay, that, it says, they are not judged. He that believeth pistuo on him is not crino judged. But he that believes not, the person that will not step out on their faith, Pistuo, they will not activate their faith. They will not make a move toward God beyond just, I agree with that. The person that believeth not is judged already because he has not believed. Pistuo activated his faith in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I hope I explained that verse correctly. I may not have. It kind of sounded confused when I did it. What, it, what happens is when you sin, when you sin, God is not judging you. He already judged you at Calvary. The judgment of this world fell on Christ at Calvary, and the punishment for sin fell on Jesus when he was tortured and died a hideous death on the cross of Calvary. That's where your judgment fell. And to be sozo delivered from damnation and hell and judgment, all you have to do is activate your faith and believe. That's why there's so many Christians in the, in the world that... Uh, a preacher out in California, his name is Ray Comfort. He, he calls them false converts. False converts. People who intellectually come to Christ and they believe, yeah, I like his theories. I like his teaching. He's a good guy. You see that in Hollywood. 
or among politicians all the time. None of them are actually born again. They're just all Jesus fans. Jesus fans. They haven't actually, Pastuo, been born again and activated their faith to believe. That's why you should never listen to a politician or a celebrity when they start talking about God. God this, God that, God here, God there. Stupid. It means nothing. It's ridiculous. It's not real. Ganeo Anathan, born again. It's a spiritual experience. A person who actually feels and senses you must be born again. Nicodemus said, well, what do I do I find my mother, spread her legs, and crawl up in her womb and then come back out again? What do you can you imagine a guy with like 160 IQ, Einstein level IQ, all kinds of degrees? Nicodemus was Nicodemus had so many degrees it was ridiculous. He was a doctor of everything. Can you imagine a guy with that kind of intellect making a stupid statement like that? How can you be that far out of it? Well, we see it all the time. It's not it's not an uncommon thing at all. Is it? Not not really. And intellectual people are some of the dumbest people you've ever met in your life. And I can prove it. Um, extremely intelligent people with huge IQs, genius level IQs, came up with the theory of evolution. Can you imagine that? I mean, on the face of it, evolution is ignorant and stupid. Nobody with half a brain would believe evolution unless they had a PhD then it makes sense, you know, oh, stupid. Extremely intelligent people, genius level IQs, told everybody that we went to the moon in 1960, what was it, 1968? We went to the moon in a tin can and landed, on, you know, what's hilarious. Now, Jesus said, I did not come into the world to crino, evaluate and condemn come to a conclusion about humanity. You're a sinner and you're, you're going to be judged and you're going to be thrown in hell. I did not come here to do that. I came here to sozo, deliver you from sin. That's why he came. Now check this out. Do Christians get judged now for their sin? Yes, they do, but it's not God doing it. First Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. What are the uh, qualifications of a elder and a bishop in the church? Well, Paul outlines it, right? And then in verse 6, he says, the person can't be a novice if they're going to serve God at the church. You don't put somebody who's a novice Neophastos is the Greek word that means a neophyte. A neophyte, a rookie. You don't put a rookie in a position of spiritual authority in your church. It says, lest he be filled with pride and he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Crema. Greek word, not crisis, evaluate, it's cream, evaluate and come to a conclusion. Moreover, verse 7, he must have a good report of those which are, are outside the church, lest he fall into the reproach. Onodismus is the Greek word for reproach or verbal abuse. And the snare, a pagis, is a trap you didn't see. You're walking along and boom, you drop. Kind of like the coyote cartoon. He was always falling down trap doors. Well, that's what a pagis is. 
the roadrunner got around the trap and he fell down into it. You see here, if when you sin, Paul's words in Galatians come clear as you can imagine. Whatever a man or woman sows, that shall they also reap. Why? Because God's going to send a lightning bolt, an earthquake. Uh, he's going to blow up your country. He's going to kill your kid. No. The Son of Man came not to crino judge you, but to save you. Well, then who's judging me? Who's Who makes this verse in Galatians, whatever a man sows, that shall he also. Who's, who's fulfilling that? The devil's doing it. Preachers call them open doors, right? That's what some of them use, open doors. Hey, you're sinning is an open door. Now, why is sinning bad for a Christian? Of course, we already know that. It's worse for a Christian than a sinner because a Christian knows better. To a person that receive much, receives much, much is required. If you know to do good and you don't do it, to them, that it's a sin for that person. Knowing what's right puts more responsibility on you than if you're ignorant. What am I talking about here? Well, outer Mongolia, you know, there are tribes out there that never heard Christ. They never heard the gospel. They don't, they haven't heard anything. They don't know anything about Jesus. Jesus who? Salvation, sinner. What are you talking about? They've never heard a word about it. Well, Paul explains in Romans that those people will be judged, not by our standard, but by their conscience, the judgment of their conscience, which God gave to every man. It's the seed of your morality, and your conscience determines your moral compass in life. So the, I don't know, pygmies in the deserts of New Guinea or whatever, they never heard They've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. They will still be judged on Judgment Day at the Great White Throne Judgment. Why? Because God gave them a conscience. And if they violated it, to them it is sin. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's what Paul said. The point of the study today is to encourage you that if you sin, God is not going to drop the hammer on you. He is not going to, Crino, judge you. The devil is. He's going to judge you. Come on. Come on. Hello? Why am I saying that? Because people who think God is judging them and he's going to send them some bad event. You're getting cancer. Your kid's going to get killed. Um, you're going to lose your house because you sinned. I'm judging you. That's not happening. God already judged you at Calvary. Now he's trying to help you overcome your sin, increase your anointing, receive your gifts, fulfill your destiny. That's what he wants to do, fulfill your destiny. He wants to see good things for you. But if you keep sinning, you're worse than a sinner. I've heard Christians criticize sinners. Okay. Oh my God. Joe Biden, he's a psycho. Oh my God. Camel Harris, she's wicked. Oh my God. Donald Trump, he's of the devil. You're worse.
I'm not tuning into this podcast again. Well, you know, there's no reason for you to leave the podcast just because I'm giving you some truth. I mean, you can be mad at me. That's okay. You're worse. Why? Because you know better. Trump, Harris, Biden, all the other psychos running for offices all over the country, they're all the same. You're worse. Because you knew the truth. You see, the more truth that God gives you, your responsibility for it goes up. My ministry has been a plague in Christianity for 20 years. I've been, I've been a literal plague. I'm the worst uh, Christian on, in the entire United States. I'm the worst one. Because what I teach over the last 20 years is the nastiest, filthiest, bluntest truth that can be spoken anywhere in the United States. I mean, I tell the truth no matter what and no matter who's listening. doesn't matter. Well, that's a problem because... If you listen to Brother Mike and he's giving you raw, unadulterated truth, you are now responsible for it since you heard it. You're worse than Trump and Biden because they don't know anything about what I'm teaching now. They're not born again Christians, they're sinners. And so he that receives much, much will be required of him. You see how dangerous the gospel is. If you preach it somewhere and somebody rejects it, they're in worse condition than if they'd never heard the gospel. It would have been better to be a pygmy in Mongolia than it would have been a Christian here in America a person who is a mental Christian who just accepts Christ. Yeah, that sounds good. I can like some of Buddhist stuff too. That person is not born again, and they're in deep trouble. But if you're born again and you hear the word of God and you don't do it, you're in worse condition than they are. Oh, God, I, I, think, I think the Lord's mad at me. He's going to... He's going to hit me with a lightning bolt right in my fanny. No, he's not. God is not judging you. The Son of God did not come to judge you. He came to save you. But, 1 Timothy chapter 3, the devil will judge you verbally and verbally abuse you and trap you. If you keep sinning, well, Brother Mike, I've been doing these sins for a while. I've been on porn for a little bit and nothing's happened to me. That's God's grace. And Paul said, do not frustrate the grace of God. That grace on your porn issue ends eventually. I had a friend of mine who came to the house of healing. Um, 2006 or something and he he loved the ministry and he used to he came regularly for years but never went through any deliverance he was a very intelligent guy and he was self-employed and uh, whenever you would meet a Christian woman usually met him at church they would date for a little while, and then they'd start having sex. And under the guise or the mental concept that, well, we're falling in love and we're getting married, well, the relationship would split. Well, I knew of uh, three or four different women over a 17-year period that he had been dating and had slept with.
And God kept forgiving him and kept having mercy on him. Until he got sick and died last year. Okay. Do not frustrate the grace of God. If you're doing something and you know it's wrong, God is not going to judge you. The devil is. The devil killed my friend Gary. He's dead now. I never even got a chance to say goodbye to him. He was got sick and got in a coma in the hospital. His uh, girlfriend, which was the fourth woman that he that I knew he was dating, she wasn't even born again. She wasn't even saved. I talked to her after he died. You imagine that? So, did something bad happen to you? God didn't do it. He likes you. He loves you. He wants to help you. He's trying to help you. You have a call of God on your life. You have a destiny in Christ. It's right there. The devil is going to steal it from you. You know why? Well, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. Couldn't be any clearer. You're going to get judged. You're going to fall into the trap of the devil. And you're going to get verbally humiliated and degraded after it's all exposed. That's what he does to TV preachers. They all, can you imagine, have you seen the TV preachers lately? I do a radio show on every one of them that has a major fall. I mean, over the years, I've been on the radio for 21 years. I must have done 45 of them, 40 of them, just crashing and burning. You know, like Jimmy Swagger and Jim Baker. <laughs> Those two are pikers compared to the guys doing it now. I mean, it's embarrassing. But what's happening there? The, the grace of God ran out. Boop. God gave them X amount of time to stop stealing money or having affairs or whatever it is. Molesting kids. That's what the, the minister is doing. He's molesting kids. He's having an affair. He's stealing money. You know, it's always... Every scandal is always either sex or money. but the, And the grace of God stayed with them. This went on for years. But then the judgment of Satan came in and their lives were destroyed. I just did last week, I just did another radio show on a pastor who committed suicide after he was arrested, made bail, came home and shot him, came home, got, got his gun, Went to a hospital, saw my radio program this week, went to a hospital, went in the men's restroom, pulled out a handgun, and shot himself right through the heart, right here, boom. Shot himself and killed himself. The demons told him, hey, you're finished, their life's over, you're going to prison, uh, You, it's the gig is up. Ha, 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 and they laughed all the way to the trigger went off. And then they took his soul into the world of the damned. Hey, the grace of God ran out. It goes for a while, and then it stops. My friend Gary is dead right now. And uh, he would not stop falling in love and sleeping with his fiancés, having sex with him. Then they would break up. He didn't break up with this last one. He died on her. This is how this system works in the heavenlies, Eperonius. This is how spiritual warfare works in the heavenlies. The point I'm trying to make here, the bigger point, I'm making several points, but the bigger one is don't ever feel that God hates you, is judging you, is pissed off at you, is about to pull his hair out because of what you're saying or doing. He's not doing that. He wants you to repent. He'll help you. He wants you to change. He'll help you. He, he likes you. He wants to help you. But if you keep doing it over a long period of time, the grace thing stops, and then the devil judges you. And then bad things really happen. Bad things really happen. Suicide, in his case, Gary died in a coma at the hospital. 
Never even got to talk to him or pray with him. Nothing. It's not God. He's not, he's not. He's on your side. He wants to help you. He's going to help you. God did not send his son into the world to judge you. He sent him there to save you, to deliver you. This is what God's trying to do. That's, that's what he wants to do. He likes you. He wants to help you. But the devil's always telling you, hey, the Lord's really mad over what you said or did. He's not going to help you anymore. You're going to get judged. You're going to, wow, he's going to send a meteor to your neighborhood and burn you up. He's going to, you see all these people, they're getting judged by, by God. Can you believe that? Fire is out in half of California on fire. Oh, that's the judgment of God. Oh my gosh, look at all these illegal immigrants coming in, tearing up the cities, still using up all the resources. God's doing that. This is their sin. They're reaping what they sowed. Well, that's true. They are reaping what they're sowed, but the devil's the one sending it. Christ did not come into this world to judge you. He came here to sozo deliver you. Now check this out. Verse 19, and this is the condemnation. Croesus now. He switches over to judge by evaluating. Croesus. This is the Croesus that light has come into the world, cosmos, humanity, and men loved darkness rather than light because their ergon works were evil. Now you see that Jesus and God is judging humanity. How? Not Crino, Croesus evaluating humanity. And that's the result of it. He evaluated humanity and he said, people will not come to the light because they love darkness. Check this out. The Greek word for darkness there is skatos. Skatos means shady. Shady light has light in it. It's mixed. Have you ever met anybody who was 100% dark? No. People are not 100% dark. They have a little bit of light mixed in with the dark. It, they're shady. So-and-so is shady. Oh, what does that mean? That means they don't lie 100% of the time. They only lie part of the time. I wouldn't trust that guy. He's a little shady. Oh, oh, I mean, he's a till of the hunt? No, but I mean, he's a good guy, but he's a little shady. Men loved shadiness. They loved bad things, but they had a little good in them. They loved the bad, but they had a little good in them. They loved darkness, shadiness, rather than light. The light turns on, and there's no darkness in there at all, representing the new birth and the new creation that you are in Christ, in your spirit man. There's no darkness at all in your spirit man. Is it in your mind? Is it in your soul, in your emotions? Is it in your body? Is it a sickness or illness? Is it demons? Yeah, that could be, but you're not totally dark. You're shady. Light mixed with darkness is shadiness. Verse 20, everyone who does evil hates light. Now, this verse, ha this verse has to be uh, interpreted properly. The Greek word proso, again, is a continuous, active continuous Greek verb, proso. It means to consistently practice evil. Sometimes a born-again Christian will do something evil, but that doesn't mean that they are totally evil because they may not be practicing that. People who practice on a consistent basis, it says here, 
everyone who does evil practices it consistently. Everyone who practices it hates light. Why? Well, he says it here. They don't come to the light. Why? Because their works, ergon, their works will be, will be what? Repro reproved. Rebuked. Exposed. So they want to hide it. And that's what these fake TV preachers do. They hide their sins until the scandal breaks. Then they try to do, you know, minimization. And if, the, and if the sin is too great, they can't minimize it. Like that guy that shot himself in the bathroom. He, he I mean, he was, he was arraigned on um, child abuse charges, molesting a child that was under, that was 12 years old, a girl. He molested a girl who was 12 years old. And so he knew it was over. And he knew the evidence was there. And the witnesses were all lined up. And he went and shot himself. Gary didn't shoot himself. He just got sick. And the devil killed him. Why? Because he wouldn't, cons he was consistently falling in love, sleeping with girls, boom, committing adultery. Verse 21, he that, does truth, proso, practice it, he that practices, consistently practices truth, comes to the light. So his deeds, his deeds will be noticed or seen. Now notice that that's the people doing it. God's not doing this, they're doing it. What's the point of the Bible study today? Don't be condemned anymore over your sin by God. You are not being judged by God. Paul hit it in Romans, didn't he? There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. You're not being judged. But if you walk after the flesh, same verse, then 1 Timothy 1 Timothy 3 kicks in, click, and the devil sets a stopwatch on you. Okay. The clock's ticking because he knows. He knows what grace is. He receives zero grace. He's not getting any grace, but he knows what grace is. Observed it trillions of times in human beings. Grace runs, runs its course and then it stops. And then the devil makes his move. Why? Because God is a, a loving God and he's fair. Are you going to do that to your kids? You're just going to let them keep doing that and let them continue it the rest of their lives so they drop dead not if you have anything anything you're able to do about it you're not going to you're not going to put up with that you know they're going to make a mistake here and then but then you're going to step in and stop it and that's what grace does it runs to here and then it quits and then the devil brings judgment but god's not judging you god's not condemning you god is not causing a catastrophe to hit you why did God give me this sickness? Why did God cause us to lose our house? Why did God? No, he didn't. He didn't. God doesn't give people sicknesses. He wants to heal them from them. God's a healer, not an infector. Father likes healing. He enjoys it. How do you know that? Why? Well, I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It was couldn't have been any more apparent. The rottenest people you ever met oh, were getting healed left and right. Why? Mercy, love. Mercy and love. But if you keep doing what you're doing, um, guess who's going to come for you? First Timothy chapter 3. You're going to get judged. You're going to get trapped. 
a pagis, a trap you do not see coming. What is a pagis? Well, how do you think they how do you think they capture tigers? Tigers in uh, in India, they catch them. You know how? Well, they don't go out there and put a leash on them. I'll tell you that. They dig a giant hole. They cover it with foliage. Can't even tell there's a hole there. They put some kind of dead carcass or something at one end of it. Tigers have can smell something a mile away. The tigers come in. They head for the carcass. They step. Wiley Coyote. They fall into a pit. The Indian ranchers come by later and they caught the tiger. A pagis. That's what's going to happen to you. Okay, you're going to keep going. I had, a, I had a friend of mine from Tucson come up for a prayer, and this guy was just wasn't ready to repent. Very intelligent person, good looking, had a great body, and you know, kind of a ladies' man type type person. Born again, he knew he knew the Lord. He'd previously served God. Good guy, basically had a good heart. And uh, at the end of the interview, I had to tell the guy, "Man, listen, dude, you're in big trouble." You're used to committing these sins. You're used to dating and sleeping with chicks. I said, look, the more you do that, the more your conscience is going to get seared. Paul used the word seared in 1 Timothy chapter 4. The Greek word is cauteriazo. It means to cauterize or harden. Well, if you keep sinning a certain type of sin, okay, you've got kind of a stash of porn on the computer over here, right? Like once a month, you'll knock off a bit of Pornhub or something. Well, you got that little stash hidden there, and you don't go there very often. But every once in a while, your sex drive goes from here to here, and you go over there. Okay? So grace covers that until it doesn't. And I was telling this guy, hey, the hammer's going to fall on you sooner or later. The devil's going to bust you up and bust you up good. He wouldn't listen to me. He didn't listen to me. And he's still in Tucson doing whatever he's doing. But I'll get a call one of these days. Oh, my God, something really bad happened to me. It's a car wreck. It's something else. I'll get that call. Hey, and I'll do my best to help. Again, you know, I don't, it's not my job to condemn people. But that's how it works. Grace runs its course in your life until it doesn't. And then the devil gets his turn. And a pagis, a trap that you fell into, that you didn't see coming. Oh my God, there's a trap there. No, you didn't even see it. And now it's time for the devil to judge you. Crino. Oh, okay. You kept sinning. I kept telling you to do something and you kept doing it, but you didn't have to pay for it because that that disgusting grace of God was on your life. That's how the devil sees it. He sees grace as disgusting. He hates it. He'd kill everybody on the planet. Literally, he could kill 8 million billion people tomorrow. He has that kind of power. The Holy Ghost won't let him do it. The Spirit of God is holding back Satan's mighty power. So the devil has to do it in dribs and drabs, and he has to have your cooperation to do it. And if you keep sinning, and you won't change, grace will cover you. It's covered. You can, you can repent right this second and get full forgiveness and full grace poured on you this very second, right now. Down the road, oops, It's the hammer's going to drop. And the devil gets legal rights. That's what preachers call it. They call them legal rights. The devil gets legal rights to butcher you. 
And sometimes you're going to die, like Gary, and other times you're not. How does that work exactly? Well, it has to be handled on an individualized basis. I don't know, but I do know this. Some people have died and other people have been given one last chance to repent. One last chance to repent. Grace extended it to you. And right now you are under grace. You are not under the law. And you need to take advantage of it. The love of God, the grace of God, it's ridiculous. I mean, it is absolutely absurd. It's so powerful, so overwhelming, so incredulous that you need to just take advantage of it today. Yeah, you do that at the store, don't you? You walk down the aisles. Oh, I like that. Oh, it's on sale. It's on sale. So you took advantage of a sale, right? You can do the same thing today with the grace of God. I hope you'll do that because at some point in time, yikes, it stops. And then whatever a man or woman sows, that shall they also reap. And you don't want to reap. I don't want to reap. I want mercy from God. I don't want to reap open doors for my sin. I want to get rid of this crap, weed it out, dump it, trash it, so that the devil down the road doesn't, I don't reach that point where, hey, it's time now. You got to, you know, the old saying, pay the piper. Yeah, as Rocky said, you want to dance, you got to, you got to pay the man. You got to pay the band if you want to dance. You, you want to borrow money, you got to pay the man. That's what Rocky said. And that's what happens in the spirit world. But I, I'm going to pretend I'm a prophet today. I'm Brother Mike the prophet. I'm prophesying that you are not going to do that. You're going to hear this message today and go, hey, you know what, this is a wake-up call. I need to remove this and that and this out of my life. And I'm going to do that right now while the grace is pouring over me. I've got grace, ridiculous, crazy grace is still mine. You bought and paid for it at Calvary, and I'm going to take advantage of it today. I'm going to win. And I'm going to go on and receive my call and fulfill my destiny in the living Christ. I'm not going to die on nothing and on nobody. When I go to heaven, it's reward city. It's not a time of tears. Not for me. Yeah, I love you. I'll see you next time. See you next Sunday.